Uh, my name is uh, Neil. Um, I'm an Android developer at Surfeasy. Um, so today I'll be talking a bit about um, Android security and specifically SSL pinning. Does everyone know what SSL pinning is? No. No? Cool, awesome. <laughs> this will make my talk a lot better. Um, so does anyone recognize this car? Yeah. Cool. Uh, it's a Nissan Leaf. Um, it's an electric car. And um, this was one of the first cars that came with a mobile app, so you could actually like turn on the AC. Uh, you could, say, turn on your heated seats. I don't know why you would want to do that, but... Um, and you can also see your driving history as well. Um, so, what exactly happened to this car? So, two security researchers, uh, Scott and Troy, um, were actually able to reverse engineer the API. <coughs> so what they actually did was that they if they knew the last five digits of the VIN's car, they could actually like remotely control the car. So yeah, it's kind of scary, but yeah, you can just turn on the AC, you can look at the driver's history. It was, it was pretty bad. And there was actually no authentication to the API, so you could actually just post or get whatever you want. <laughs> and they, they, I mean, they fixed it a little bit later, but... Um, similarly, <laughs> Another application um, called Path. It's a common application for app. And uh, what they did was um, someone else from the engineer the API found that in the background they were uploading the user's complete address book. And um, so some guy wrote a big article about it. There was a lot of PR, and they finally fixed it and issued an update promptly that later asked for that user's permission. So you're probably asking why am I showing you this and. How did these guys actually figure the API out? So, to understand, uh, most of APIs are now communicated over HTTPS, hopefully. Everyone who's not using HTTPS should. Um, <clears throat> so, both, in both these examples, the APIs were using HTTPS. Um, and to understand how they were actually able to reverse engineer their apps, um, you have to kind of understand how a cell works. I mean, if I give you a full explanation of SSL, I'll probably be here for a, a, lot, a while. So I'm just going to talk about one step of the process, which is uh, called the server hello. So the client actually validates the server's uh, certificate. So the server responds with the certificate, and the client checks with its actual device's trust door to validate that certificate is correct. So the device's trust door is a bunch of certificates that's actually stored on the device. For example, any uh, like a browser, a Chrome, actually have their own um, trust store as well. So that's how you actually validate that the um, client and server are actually, in fact, talking to one another. So in order to actually bypass this process, um, what you could do is um, a man in the middle of SSL traffic. So I don't know if any of you have used, uh, there's a bunch of tools available, as Charles Proxy, Fiddler, man in the middle proxy. And they're actually pretty cool. You could actually install, say, um, Netflix's app. I, I checked approximately sometime last year. And they do not use certificate panic pinning in their apps, so you could actually see their entire API, which is kind of cool. Um, so the way it works is you install a root certificate uh, from the actual, not, not a root certificate, but a certificate from one of those proxy tools on your device, and you're actually able to inspect the traffic. So it works something like this. Um, you install the, the, the SSL proxy certificate on your device, and uh, you connect your phone to uh, the proxy that's running on your laptop, and any uh, communication that comes from the app, you'll we'll actually be able to see it on your laptop. So in order to actually circumvent this or um, protect your apps a little better, there's something called certificate pinning, and what you do is instead of checking the certificates on your device's trust store, you would actually ship your certificates with the app. And you all, you have to uh, also ask your companies like TLS Administrator, who is running the server side, to make sure you can do this. Um, so don't go ahead and implement certificate app without the permission to do so. <laughs> um, so for example, uh, this is my own website. You can see that there's different levels of uh, certificates. You have your, uh, you have your root certificate, intermediate certificate, and leaf certificate. 
And generally, the leaf certificate is the closest one, meaning uh, that's the one that's right on your server side. So it's, the, it's a good idea to pin against that one, because that gives you the 100% certainty that that's the actual certificate. And say, for example, if you pin against the root or inter an intermediate CA, um, your intermediate certificate authority can actually issue a, a certificate for someone else. So uh, certificate authorities do mess up sometimes. So um, <clears throat> it's always good to pin against multiple levels in the chain. But for these certificates, for example, for Let's Encrypt, I think their renewal time is around 90 days. I'm not 100% sure. But it's a very short period of time. And as we know, Android users don't really like updating. So, uh, <laughs> um, uh, the, the user will be in a brick state if that certificate ever changes. So, um, <clears throat> either we could pin against a root cert, and which it lasts for um, 90, for at least 20 years or something like that. Um, but there's a better way, and that's called uh, public key pinning. So, even if your leak certificates change, the actual uh, public key doesn't. So you can pin against that, and you would pin with the subject public key info, and that's basically the public key, plus a bunch of other parameters like the RSA algorithm and some other. For a quick implementation, I don't want to go through all the details, but if you want to use OKHTP, or if you are using OKHTP, there's something called a certificate pinner, and what you do is you'll add each of the root intermediate um, or leaked um, public key hashes, and if you want to get the public key hash, it's an OpenSSL command, or you can just actually use a certificate pinner with some wrong hash, and I'll say, hey, please use this hash. So it's pretty easy to use. And if you're well, a very lucky person and your app is supporting a min SDK of 24, which is probably no one, which is Android 7, you can actually include this uh, XML file, and you can specify the hashes that's straight in there. And that would actually protect against any web view request too, which is pretty neat. So after this explanation, you probably think, okay, we're safe. Um, we protected our API. No one can export any other holes in our API. But unfortunately, we're not. Um, the, the, the reality is that if a user has a rooted phone, there's actually a lot of exposed frameworks that they can install on their device to actually disable the Java SSL packages. So Sorry, the Java self packages, so the whole certificate pinning will actually not take place. Um, <clears throat> but I guess the whole point of this is to actually make your attacker's job harder and to actually protect any, any other like real man in the middle exploits on production, perhaps. Um, any questions? Oh, sorry, just to double check if I understood correctly. So by not doing this, you're exposing our APIs, is that? It's, yeah, it's fairly easy to actually uh, see all the like, API requests going back and forth, yeah. Okay, so for example, with Snapchat, I know that there's, um, like, I guess, a hack version of it called Casper, I believe. So is that like, what a developer would use for them to see like, what APIs they can access to like, show you the images and so on? Perhaps, so perhaps a developer of Casper, what is it called, Capster? Casper. Casper, yeah. yeah. So they might have reverse engineered Snapchat app and saw, okay, these are the APIs they use, this is the API key, IP, API key they use, and they're able to actually create their own app. Because the server side just trusts them as a client, right? Okay. Sure, go ahead. I have kind of a vague question. Um, I used to use Charles a lot, but was there something that changed in Android 7 that made it trickier to use proxies? Yes, it is trickier to use. Um, I know what you're talking about, but I have, actually haven't experienced it. <laughs> but I was reading something earlier. Um, I think it only actually now works. You have to actually set a field for debuggable apps or something like that. I actually don't know. Um, but yeah, there is something in front of it. Sure. Uh, I have a what did you mean by uh, Android, Android users don't like updating? <laughs> <laughs> they probably don't have auto update on, I don't know. They just don't but like it. And auto update is enabled by people. Did you mean like the vendors don't send out updates to Android as an OS and you were inferring that users don't like that? Um, no, not the actual Android OS, OS <laughs> updates. You meant apps. App updates. I'm just 
going from experience here, a lot of our users on our apps tend to keep it for a very long time. Oh, really? I found the opposite. That's why I was curious. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think it really depends on your users as well. Yeah. So, yeah. Any more questions? Sure, we'll have yeah, just, just a little check. So when you uh, pin to a public uh, key, so like there's, there's no re renewal uh, issues with that anymore? Like as, a as long as you don't change certificate authorities. So example, if you're staying with, um, I don't know, uh, Semantic, which, which might be a bad example. Um, okay. they, as long as you stick with them, then your public key shouldn't change, I believe. Has, has there been any, any research in, like, if I can, would, it, would it be possible to spoof that in any way as, as well? Or? I don't think so. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I guess not.